Hello, YouTube world. Welcome to another episode of For Your CNA's live question and answer session. I'm Miss Patty, your host from For Your CNA. Uh, just getting set up here. When you come in, uh, just type something in the chat so I know that you're here. This is your opportunity to ask questions about testing, uh, CNA training, uh, what CNAs do, what CNAs are called, your scope of practice, basically anything CNA related, we're here to help you out with. Um, we do this every Thursday at three. So for those of you coming in, I'm glad you're able to join us. Usually uh, when we start these, um, I give a little lesson that, you know, I kind of talk a little bit while I'm waiting for everybody to come in. And today our lesson is going to be on indirect care. Now, this is kind of a very murky subject. Most people don't really understand what indirect care is. And um, a lot of people uh, kind of assume it's bedside manner, the way you treat the patient, you know, all of that, the nice things, you know, being nice. And that does play a part in it for sure. But very few people know that with Prometric testing, there's actually an entire guide that the evaluators have to use when they're grading those indirect testing checkpoints. So this is a, a this is going to be kind of a behind the scenes view into the whole testing process. So when you have an evaluator um, for the exam, hi Blue, thanks for joining. When you have an evaluator for the state exam, they have a checklist and the checklist looks something like this, okay? These are actually published on Prometric's website. You can go look at the checklist, um, but this would be the checklist. But at the bottom of the checklist, this is where it gets really confusing for students when you're looking at those checklists because, hi, uh, Gilo, because the, the bottom five um, checkpoints are all on indirect care and they're not spelled out. It just said, does the candidate ask the resident about preferences, use standard precautions and infection control measures, ask the resident about comfort, promote resident rights and promote resident safety. But it doesn't, those checklists don't really give you a whole lot of direction on what they're looking for specific to that topic. And then if you get, um, if you get an infraction or what they call a deficiency, let me see if I've got one here to show you. Uh, I don't know where my deficiency is, but if you get a deficiency, it's only going to tell you that um, you got a deficiency on failure to promote safety. And you're going to be like, well, what does that even mean? What did I not do that they needed to see? So it gets really, really murky. Now, this has come up countless times, but I actually had a friend of mine who is um, the director of the program down in uh, the, a very, very large college in Miami. And uh, she contacted me and she said, okay, I've got these results. I don't know what they mean. What possibly could she have done wrong? So I, it kind of uh, led me to um, develop this whole training for her so she would understand. And then I thought, well, you guys could probably use this as well. So this is something available on Prometric's website. It's under indirect care. And it actually says that at the top. And it, it tells you about indirect care behaviors. But if you go to the next page, there's like, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 pages here, lots of pages. Um, if you go to the, la the next page, you'll actually see that they are divided into skills. So this one would be ambulate, right? So this is the ambulate skill. I know you guys are backwards. I know. Um, I still am working on technology. Bear with me. But you can print this off and look at it yourself. But this is ambulate. And it tells you specifically right here what they're looking for, for that standard precautions, right? So if you have a student who is taking the test and gets Ambulate and the deficiency is on standard precautions, this right here is telling you exactly what that student failed to do. So when, so it, it's, it's kind of divided into two um, places you have to look if you're an instructor um, 
developing your curriculum. You have to look at the actual clinical skills checklist, and then you have to look at the indirect care and try to merge those together. Well, what I did this week is I actually merged those together um, for uh, all the skills. So those testing care plans that I have, these guys here, these yellow cards. <clears throat> So these are used in classrooms. It has the three skills and on the back it has the checklist. Well, what I did is I created new checklists. They're going to go like this. And it actually has all of those indirect care things built right in. So now we've got one checklist that has absolutely everything in it. But this still doesn't really explain to you what is indirect care. What are they looking for? What, what are some of the things that they're grading you on? Well, if it's a washing skill, having the patient check the water temperature is an indirect care checkpoint. So it's not in the regular checkpoint. It's actually an indirect care. Um, introducing your, yourself by name is actually an indirect care. Knocking on the door before you enter is in indirect care. Um, identifying your patient by name is in indirect care. And this is one of the questions I actually got on my YouTube channel this week, and it kind of meshed in really nicely. Um, KEJC, uh, K-E-J-S-I, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, um, said that uh, we were taught to check ID bands and take away the call light. Is that Okay. So I want to kind of answer their question because it really taught, it really has to do with that indirect care checkpoint. So in indirect care, the very first thing they're looking at right here, right at the top, it says um, that the, re the student has to knock and announce themselves before they enter the room. They have to address the resident by name and they have to introduce themselves as well. Now you have to do all of this before you do anything else. This is the very first thing you have to do for every single skill. You have to knock, you have to identify your patient by name and introduce yourself. Those are non-negotiable. If you don't do those things, you're not going to pass the state exam. So it all starts right there. And the knocking is actually under indirect care. So you have to knock. You also have to identify yourself, your, your patient by name, because for the test, there will be no ID bands. And that's because the majority of our patients where most patients are seen don't have ID bands. Now, I know you're thinking about the hospital. And yes, we have ID bands in the hospital, but that's not the only place that medicine happens. Any place that the patient lives. So think nursing homes, assisted living facilities, home care you're not going to have ID bands because you don't have ID bands where you live, right? Where you live, people should know you. That's where you live. So there's no ID bands in those settings. Um, and that is, believe it or not, the majority of patient care occurs in nursing homes, assisted living, and home care. That's where the majority of our patients are. But even in doctor's offices, they don't give you ID bands. Walk-in clinics, they don't give you ID bands. So a lot of healthcare occurs in places where ID bands don't even exist. So we can't test you on, on checking an ID band if that's not the standard for the majority of healthcare, right? So we don't need them. You do not need ID bands. And guys, ID bands are often wrong. Uh, I had this situation. My daughter, um, who's a mom, my daughter took my granddaughter to a hospital that my daughter had been in when she was younger. And they put my daughter's ID band on my granddaughter. So, you know, she, she, was the mom. She wasn't the patient. So sometimes ID bands can get um, used improperly, right? They can mistaken identities. So you have to be really, really careful if that's all you're using. But in the majority of cases, the way that you identify a patient is simply to say their name. And they will tell you whether that's them or not. Or you can ask them, can you please state your name to me? That works as well. 
Now, I know some of you are saying, but wait, 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 what about dementia? What about stroke patients? What if the patient can't talk? All that. Well, remember, we already have a, a, a solution in place for that. Every nurse does an assessment on the patient and looks for real problems and potential problems. Well, this is a real problem, right? The patient has to be able to identify themselves or we have to be able to identify the patient. So how does the nurse want to solve that problem? There's a million ways to solve it. That's going to be reflected in the care plan based on the needs of that particular patient. So there's already a, a system in place to handle this. You don't have to um, reinvent the wheel. But for the test, so we're going to bring this back to the test. For the test, your patient the person playing the patient is another testing student. So this is somebody who is able to identify themselves, somebody who is able to state their name. So for the test, we're simply going to announce the patient's name out loud, or we're going to ask them, what is your name? Can you please state your name to me? Um, and that is an important checkpoint. If you don't get that, it's going to count against you on indirect care. And when you get your results, you may not know well, what did I not do? It just says indirect care. It doesn't tell me what I missed. So that is one of the checkpoints under indirect care. Now, the other thing that Kesji said is that we were taught to take uh, take the call light away. Now, I'm a little confused by this, um, why you would take a call light away from a patient uh, when you're in the room. I mean, it doesn't really, they're not going to use the call light, right? If they need help, you're right there. That's the whole purpose of the call light is to hit it, to get somebody to come in and help you. If you're right there, they, they have no need for the call light, but you don't need to physically take it away from them either. That just, it seems like an unnecessary step and it, it seems a little almost rude. Um, I, I don't like the way that that, that um, is handled. So you really don't need to address the call light at all in the beginning of the skill. Now, the end of the skill you do. And this I found interesting. I learned something this week when I was going through the indirect care checklist. And what I learned is all about the call light. So the last column here, let me turn this around. I know it's backwards, guys. Bear with me. But the last column here under safety, and I don't know if you can read it, but it says leave call light in or near resident's hand or on the bed within reach at the end of skill. OK, so this skill, which is feeding, allows you to leave the call light in or near their hand or on the bed at the end of the skill within reach. But there's most of these, right? So these are all skill specific. Remember, the skills are all listed here, right? All skill specific. Most of these don't say on the bed. It says in or near the resident's hand. So when you're testing, if that call light is not near the resident's hand at the end of skill, you might get dinged for safety under indirect care. Isn't that funny? So um, what I'm telling my students now is for every skill, make sure that that call light is in or near the resident's hand. Having it on the bed is not enough for all of the skills. There are a few it is, but for the majority of skills, it's not. You need it in or near their hand. Now it goes one step further for side lying position, right? When we turn a patient over on their side, the checklist actually says, let me pull it up here for you. Hold on. Okay. Do you see this right here? Checklist actually says that that call light has to be in the hand of the side that they have been turned toward. So changing position, it actually indicates which hand that call light needs to be in. And same for dressing a resident with a weak arm, the call light needs to be on the stronger side in that hand. And I already taught that, but I found it very interesting that these checkpoints are graded under indirect care. So um, make sure if you're preparing for the test and you're looking at that clinical skills checklist, that's going to get you about 90% of the way there. But you also need to be looking at these, the indirect care checkpoints as well. You can see there's a whole lot of checkpoints here. 
for these skills that aren't reflected on the regular clinical skills checklist. So keep that in mind if you're preparing for the test and you're using those checklists that are on Prometrics website. Remember that there's other checkpoints that you have to go to a different place to find. Um, um, or you can just, you know, the, these, the uh, I've combined them here. So all the indirect ones are actually indicated. Um, these are going to be on my care plan uh, checklist in a couple of weeks. I've got to get them printed. So let's see who's here. I hope that helps you guys when you're preparing for the test. Um, Ramses, hi, Wendy. Hello, Worry Girl. Hello, Nurse Alima. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> she says, thank you so much for everything. You're more than welcome. Thank you so much. Siliana says, good morning, everyone. Uh, worry girl, my test is, is tomorrow. Oh my gosh. I bet you are so nervous. I bet you are. But remember that it's all about the patient. If you focus on the patient, you'll be you'll be great. And um, if you haven't had a chance yet, go to my website and watch those animated lessons because they will help you perfect your performance and make sure that you pass. So best of luck, Worry Girl. We're going to we're gonna send out great vibes to you. Kanisha says, hey, Miss Patty, I signed up for my exam, but I have to reschedule it for another date. Well, make sure that you um, get in touch with uh, your testing agency quickly. You don't want to wait till the last minute because they may charge you. So they've got to have a lot of notice to reschedule. So make sure you get in touch with them to reschedule. But we uh, we wish you all kinds of luck, Kanisha. And Marachi says, hi, Miss Patty. Jennifer, hi. Nazeth says, good luck on your exam. So yeah, we're going to send, uh, send Worry Girl lots of luck for her exam. And Queen Stella says, hello, Nurse Patty. How are you today? I am fantastic today. It is a great day. Uh, Tahir says, hi, Miss Patty. Emanuela says, hi, Miss Patty. Jennifer says, okay, so here we're getting into some questions, okay? Jennifer says, so do you currently work as a nurse or teach and teach, or do you only teach? Have you worked in a hospital or only at long-term care facilities? Great question, Jennifer. Right now, I am not doing any bedside nursing because this takes all of my time and attention. Um, so I do a lot of things other than just teach, but they all revolve around my um, my company for your CNA. I uh, speak at conferences and I coordinate with instructors and help them um, you know, perfect their teaching strategies. I create books. I'm actually writing a new book right now for the instructors, the instructors edition. Um, I'm working on some other projects. We are card game. That's the card game is what has taken all of my time and attention lately. Cause it's a lot of graphics, super excited. I got that done literally right before I came on live with you guys. So I'm super excited about the card game. I'll be sending it over uh, to the print for proofing. And hopefully in the next couple of uh, weeks, we'll have uh, some prototypes that I can show you. And I'm super excited about that. But no, I'm not doing any bedside nursing right now, just simply because I, I don't have time. This takes all of my time and attention. Um, and, you know, I'm very blessed that I get to do what I love to do. But to answer your question, where have I worked? Um, I've worked in hospitals. I worked in the ICU. Um, I've worked as a telemetry nurse, and that has to do with the heart uh, rhythm monitoring. I've worked in uh, walk-in clinics and doctor's offices and nursing homes. I was the school nurse for a year at our local district, uh, taking care of um, exceptional students, ESE. Uh, so I was the school nurse for a year. I worked, uh, hospice was my most recent patient specific job. Um, and I loved being a hospice nurse. I was a case manager for hospice for five years, and it probably was my favorite um, type of nursing. But I like them all for different reasons, right? Doctor's offices and walk-in clinics, it's great because you're not working nights and weekends. Um, nursing homes, I'll always have a soft spot in my heart for because these are the most vulnerable people in our community, and they need the most compassionate care 
that they can get. And I, I do love working in nursing homes because of that, because it's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I loved ICU. Oh, I, I'm an adrenaline junkie. Um, I am the type of person that likes not knowing what's coming in the door and likes having to problem solve and learn new things. So I loved the ICU. Um, and, you know, every place is just a little bit different. I've worked uh, part time in psych because I wanted to learn a little bit more about psych. So I worked um, part time nights for two years in a, a psychiatric hospital, inpatient hospital, rotated through all of their different uh, divisions. And I, that was quite an education. I really really enjoyed uh, that opportunity. So lots of different places that in every one of them I've liked for different reasons. And they've all given me a lot of knowledge and, and experience that I can then pass on to you guys. And I can use to create training programs uh, for other instructors. Uh, Blue says, what's the most confusing part of indirect care for students? What is often the most forgotten or missed part that you've experienced? A oh, great question, Blue. To be honest with you, it's something that I talk about a lot. Don't forget about the patient, right? Because during the test, you are so wrapped up in your own head. You're thinking about the steps and the supplies and what am I supposed to do? And I don't want to forget this or that. And you're just all wrapped up in your own head. And a lot of times you forget that there's a live body in the bed that you're supposed to be interacting with. So when you get so worked up over the steps, when you get so focused on the doing that you forget who you're trying to benefit, that's where most people go off the rails with indirect care. So that's one of the things that I, I say a lot is don't forget it's all about the patient. If you can refocus your attention on that patient during the test, you'll make sure that they're always in the middle of the bed because they'll look funny if they're on the edge of the bed. They'll look unsafe. But if you're not paying attention to the patient, you'll miss it. Um, if you're paying attention to the patient, you'll notice if they're uncovered or undressed. You'll notice that their environment still has a chucks on an overbed table or that they can't reach the call light or they just look like they're in an, in an uncomfortable position. So it's all about refocusing on that patient at all times. And if you can do that, the indirect care stuff pretty much takes care of itself. But there are some very specific checkpoints in there that um, it helps to know about, like making sure the call light is in the hand or but right beside the hand at the end of the skill. But again, focusing on the patient would help you kind of um, notice that, right? So blue, focus on the patient. That's the one thing that indirect care um, often gets dinged on. Jennifer says, my coworker was trying to tell me memory care facilities are considered skilled nursing. Is that true? I don't think it is. This is, how do I put it? It's kind of a gray area. Um, a memory care unit by itself is not considered skilled nursing. No, no, it's not. It's custodial care. But there are some locked dementia units that have a skilled care licensure. I know it gets very, very murky here. It all has to do with licensure. Um, because those, those, okay, so let me explain this, right? So you are able to cope and adapt fine. You're an adult. If somebody, you know, throws a curveball at you, you're able to kind of figure out what to do. You can problem solve, right? So if your car gets a flat tire, you can problem solve that. If your kid is late coming home from school, you can problem solve that. Um, you are able to adapt to things as they come up to you. Well, when you develop de dementia, that's one of the things that's affected. You can no longer adapt. So if you have no coping skills, if you're not able to um, fix things, right, if, if you can't 
problem solve anything because you don't have the the um, neurons are no longer connecting. They're, they're, they're not talking to each other. So there's no way to problem solve. So in those environments, routine has to be like priority number one. Everything has to be exactly the same all the time. Nothing ever changes. Breakfast is at 730. Lunch is at 12. Dinner's at 530. This is what you do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Routine oriented. Because when you have routines, there's no coping involved. Nothing changes. So nothing needs to be accommodated, right? So this is why dementia units thrive on routine. And this is why we like to have the same staff all the time, because then the patients don't have to cope with anything new. So dementia units are all about routine consistency. But dementia patients get sick too, and they get um, diabetic ulcers on their leg, and they get uh, where they need IV hydration because they're not drinking enough. And they get, they get these, these other medical things that happen that they need treatment for. But remember, dementia can't cope. So if we take them out of that dementia environment and put them in the hospital, they're just going to like go off the rails because they don't have that coping ability. So a lot of dementia units have a skilled nursing certification. So then we can have a nurse come in and take care of those issues while the patient remains where they're at so that they don't have to cope with change. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Okay. So a dementia unit by itself, not usually considered a skilled nursing facility. It's custodial care. Yes, they may need a very high level of care. But if you remember, we talked about this um, a couple weeks ago. Personal care, bathing, dressing, grooming, feeding, toileting, all those things is not nursing care. Remember that. Somebody may be total care, right? Total care. They can't do anything for themselves, but that's still not nursing care. That's still personal care, right? Now, if they have a catheter, that bumps it up into nursing care. If they have a G-tube, that bumps it up into nursing care. If they've got wounds that need to be monitored, that bumps them up into nursing care. So nursing is different, right? Personal care, somebody can be totally bed bound and still be considered non-nursing. So I hope that that makes sense, right? So just because somebody has dementia and may even be total care from a personal care standpoint does not mean that they need skilled care. So most nursing, uh, I'm sorry, most long-term care dementia units are not skilled, but they may have a skilled licensure to meet the needs of the patient without having to move them. I hope that helps. Okay. Um, let's see here. Blue's blue Chinini says in Washington state, it depends on what's meant by memory care and the level of care given and how Medicare Medicaid defines facility. Yeah. And that's going to play a part of it, but this is, um, Medicare and Medicaid do not define personal care skills as skilled care. Um, Jennifer says, what if someone isn't able to identify themselves when you ask for their name? Great question, Jennifer. So remember, that's always going to be defined in your care plan for that particular patient. Um, it may be a photo in a, a, a patient log that you're going to compare it to. It may be a um, wristband. It may be a band on their ankle. There, there's a lot of different uh, ways that we can solve that problem, but it's going to depend on the patient themselves. So always go, if you can't identify the patient either by name or they can't tell you their name, you would go to the care plan to find out how you're supposed to identify this patient since they're not able to cooperate. Um, let's see here. Uh, Kanisha says, can you email me those checklists so I can study? Um, well, Kanisha, just go on to Prometric's website. It's under indirect care and you can print it off yourself. I'm going to be selling them the, the care plan sets, these things, once I get the new um, the new backs on them, but I still have to send them to the printer. So it's going to take me a couple of weeks to get these ready, um, but I will be selling them on my website. But you can print off the actual, this checklist right here is free for everybody on Prometric's website. It's under indirect care behaviors. Um, 
Uh, G Lo says, I've not started my class yet, but your video and teaching has taught me a lot. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Kanisha says, yes, I talked to Prometric yesterday to reschedule for another day, but they don't have anything until probably April. I have to call them within a week to get another day. Yeah. Okay. So let me talk about that because this is something that most people don't know. There is a season <laughs> to testing, right? So um, they have a busy season. You know, like every other, every industry has some sort of a busy season. Well, the spring is Prometric's busy season because all the high school programs are graduating. The college programs are graduating. And that just puts a ton of candidates into the, um, the, the system that need to be tested. So a lot of these evaluators are now having to go to schools to test in addition to their normal testing centers that they go to. So it's high demand from about mid-March until June. And testing gets bogged down in Prometric during these times. So if you're testing in the spring, you have to pack a lot of patients because you may not be testing in the same time frame as somebody, say, in October where, you know, the volume's pretty low. They, you know, they may register for the test and get a testing date within like three weeks. And you're sitting here at six weeks going, oh my gosh, why is this taking forever? Well, it all has to do with the amount of people that are trying to test during that time frame. And the spring is super, super busy. Um, but good luck, Kanisha. Ida says, hi, Ida from Central Florida. I really appreciate you. Hi, Ida. I'm also in Central Florida. And this is a beautiful day out there. Um, this is why we live in Florida. <laughs> Fred says, how do I start? Um, well, Fred, I, I'm i not real sure what you're trying to accomplish. Are you trying to take the CNA class? Are you trying to take the CNA test? Um, I'm, if you can give me a little bit more information, I might be able to help you. Um, if you're just studying for the test, that's a little bit different. Um, so give me a little more information and I can help kind of guide you where you need to go. Uh, Wendy also wants to check lists. Again, Wendy, go to Prometrics website under indirect care behaviors, um, under candidate resources, and you can print those off yourself as well. So, um, Blue says, if you want to work in mental health, my advice is to have very, very thick skin with a side of patience. Oh, yeah, you have to have patience. Absolutely. Um, and you have to have a pretty good understanding of all of the different types of mental illness and how um, the manipulation will try to come in. And you have to learn how to kind of sidestep it. And um, I, I really, really enjoyed my time in mental health. It's a totally different type of nursing. Very, very different. But I really enjoyed it. And yeah, thick skin is, is definitely helpful. Uh, Milagro says, hi, Patty. I was wondering if you fail the test, you have to pay a testing fee again. Yes, nothing is free. But you only have to pay for the section that you failed. So if you failed the written, that's going to be less money than retesting on the skills. So skills, I think, is 105 written. I think is 50 in Florida. Every uh, state charges a different amount. Um, but that's, I believe, what our fees are in Florida. But you would only have to re repay for the section that you have to retake. Now, my advice is don't fail the first time. <laughs> if you pass both on the first time, you don't have to retest and you don't have to repay. So that's where I come in. All of my resources are designed to help you pass the test on the first time so you don't have to retest. Um, so uh, Jennifer says, yeah, I know, Jennifer, it's on my list. Jennifer says, I thought you were going to talk about why diabetics crave sweets. I know it's something on my list and I will get to it next week. But I just wanted to talk about this indirect care thing because it came up this week when I was working with an instructor. And I just thought it's something that you guys would benefit from as well. But hold on, I'm going to do this. I am making myself a note, diabetes, and I'm going to put it right here. And next week, we will talk about diabetes. Uh, Marley says, hi. Nicole says, hi, Miss Patty. I have a question. When doing the test and you get to do bed bath and they say do the right side, should we touch under the left side of the next breast? Okay, so Nicole, let me explain this. When you go take the test, those evaluators 
they want to be home, right? They, they're, they're trying to make the test as comprehensive as possible, but also kind of shorten it. It's a long day for everybody. So if they have to watch you go through, you know, this whole long bed bath and it takes forever, everybody's going to get like short tempered by the end of the day. So that's why partial bed bath exists. And the care plan specifically tells you exactly what to wash. Face, neck, chest, abdomen, side, one arm and hand and back. So it's, you know, they may tell you right arm or left arm. They may specify, but it's very, very specific. And it's all designed to cut down on time. Because if you have to go around to the other side of the bed to wash the other arm, you've got to put a towel under that arm. You've got to wash it. You've got to rinse it. You've got to dry it. And it's going to add three or four minutes onto the skill. And the skill is already 19 minutes long. We're trying to shorten it. So when they're saying wash, you know, the, the right side, they're not... It, it's not like you're drawing a line right down the middle of the patient and you're only going to wash. It's you're going to wash what the care plan tells you to wash. So if you, you know, go over to the, the other side and, and um, you know, you're, you're washing, if it says wash the chest and you wash the chest, that's fine. They're not grading how far down the side you're going. It's not that technical. It's about following the care plan. If the care plan says to wash one arm and hand and you go over and you do both, you're not following the care plan. So whatever that care plan is telling you to do or the nurse by extension, because remember, the nurse writes the care plan, um, whatever that nurse is telling you to do or the care plan is instructing you to do, that's what you're going to follow to the T. Um, but it's not it's not like they're judging in inches. Oh, you went an inch too far this way. It's um, it's all about the care plan. So if they say wash the chest, wash the chest. If they say uh, wash the right side of the chest, then wash the right side of the chest. If they say wash the right arm and hand, don't do the left. Um, follow that care plan. That's what it's all about. It's not really about... Um, you know, hard and fast lines. Because if you ask me where the right side ended and and you ask somebody else where the right side ended, we'd probably come up with slightly different variations. Are we talking about, you know, somebody with breasts that are on the side? Are we talking about um, underarm? I mean, you know, it, it, it there's levels of interpretation there. That's not what they're getting into. That's not what this is about. This is all about showing that you know how to wash, how to rinse, how to dry, and that you're going to keep the patient covered and warm during it. Um, and the, the care plan is there to tell you what areas to wash using those particular rules. I hope that helps. Um, Blue says, Miss Patty, I got out of healthcare administration and moved into home care education and training because all the state laws, Medicare, Medicaid rules kept giving me massive headaches. <laughs> yes. And I ended up miserable. Yeah, Blue, I know. And the rules change all the time. And even worse, it changes depending on what um, who you're working with at the agency and how they're interpreting the rules. I know. Uh, bureaucracy. Do you see the gray? <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, let's see here. Blue says, I really appreciate all the advice and videos. Really helpful in teaching home care workers. Well, thank you, Blue. I really appreciate I'm glad that I'm able to be part of your journey. Um, I know that that uh, you've been uh, a steadfast um, uh, proponent of ours, and we really appreciate that. Uh, you're probably one of my biggest fans, and I thank you for that. Uh, Marley says, I took the test back in November and I didn't pass it. Can I still take it? Yes, Marley. Absolutely. You have two years where um, to, to retest. If you pass one part of it, that one part still stands for two years. So please, please re-register and take it and um, hope you pass. But if you go onto my website, watch my skills videos and my animated videos, those will go a long way to helping you. Uh, prepare for the state exam. And those are all free on my website. My online course takes all of that and adds in a whole bunch more. So it's the next step. And that's a little bit of money, but the, the free videos are there for you. Um, if you want that extra bit of help, the online program might be a good option for you. 
Um, let's see here. Uh, Kanisha says, thank you. Nurse Elema says, I'm trying to become a testing center. It's so difficult to get a hold of someone. I contacted an email corporate, but no one has replied as of yet. Yeah, um, Elema, it, it is going to be a little bit difficult for you, especially right now. Pack your patients because they are in their, their busy testing season. So it may take a little bit of time. But I have found with Prometric that persistence is the key. Um, you kind of have to be the squeaky wheel. And I hate to say that. I really wish I could tell you they had better customer service. Um, they could use a little bit of help in this arena, I think. But uh, persistence does pay off. And you can always call and ask for the regional supervisor. And uh, you may be able to get somewhere with that. Okay. Uh, Milagro says, my test is on March 5th. Ooh, so exciting. Right around the corner, two days. Uh, good luck, Milagro. We're going to keep our fingers crossed and send out lots of good testing vibes for you. Um, Jennifer says, I'm really interested in learning about diabetes, including why you shouldn't clip their toenails. Okay, I will get into that in detail. <laughs> Marie says, good afternoon. I love your lectures. I'm waiting to get a test date. Oh, how exciting, Marie. Um, Milagro says, so if you pass the skills and you fail the written test, you don't have to take it again. Yeah, you only have to retake the part that you failed. So if you pass the skills, then you don't have to retake the skills. You just have to retake the written. Um, Wendy says, so I'd like to know, do the Ar uh, Arkansas have two years to retake their test? Yes. Arkansas also uses Prometric and that is a two, Prometric is uniform across all states that use Prometric. So there's 14 states and every single one of them operates exactly the same way. So yes, you still have two years. Um, nurse says, I write a letter every week. Do you think that's too much? No, <laughs> no. Um, pay, uh, yeah. And I would, I would probably go a step further because the letters probably aren't getting where they need to go. I would call, I would call and ask for a regional supervisor. Um, there's also an email on Prometric's website that you have to dig for it look hard, but there is an email on Prometric's website and um, you can email that often. <laughs> Wendy says, my test is on March 17th and um, very good, Wendy. It's super, super exciting to know that your test is coming up, but you're probably in that panic mode. Like, oh my gosh, it's coming up, but it's not so close yet. So now you're trying to wonder, how do I practice? Am I doing things right? Um, you know, it's close, but it's not um, not like two days away, right? Um, so it's really easy to put off practice when it's two weeks down the road, right? Um, my suggestion is make sure you've done the skills at least once, every single skill at least once before you go test. That will give you the best chance of success. OK, so good luck. Um, you'll you'll get more motivated the closer the date comes, I promise. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, nurse found it. Yay. Um, Jennifer said, no, Oregon is not Prometric, Jennifer. And if you want to know what states um have what testing centers. If you go to my website for your CNA.com, everybody should know that now, the number four, Y O U R C N A.com. Halfway down the main page, you'll see a map. And in that map has little pins. Every pin tells you what testing agency that state uses. And it actually links right over to that state's website for testing. So if you're in Oregon, you just go onto my website, click on Oregon on the map, you'll see the pin, click on the link, and it'll take you right to the testing agency for Oregon. Okay. Um, let's see here. Sasha says, mine is tomorrow. Oh my goodness. That's so exciting. Pass the written the first time, but not the skills. Sasha, you need to be watching my skills videos tonight. Don't sleep. Watch my skills videos. They'll get you what you need to, to learn. Um, great. Uh, great talk today, guys. This is so exciting. Lots of people are testing. Hey, you guys that are all testing, um, make sure that you drop by my web, you know, my YouTube channel and leave me a comment and let me know that you passed. Um, I've only got three people to congratulate this week on passing the state exam. 
NZ dropped by and told me that they passed the state exam. Congratulations. Maria A. Lopez passed this week. And Stephanie Lolagny passed this, this week. And we want to say congratulations to all of them. Um, but if you if you're testing this week, and I see quite a few of you are, make sure that you let it drop by and let us know so I can congratulate you and welcome you into healthcare as well when you pass. Lion's Heart Tarot, I think it is, um, is testing soon as well. So we're going to send them some good vibes um, along with um, those of you who have told me this um, that you're testing soon as well, like. Milagro and um, Wendy is testing soon. And I know there was another one. Um, I'm not, I can't see that far back, but I know there's several of you who said that you're testing. Make sure you let us know how you're doing because we really, really want to um, congratulate you when you pass. So yeah, Milagro, I know you're nervous and I hope you pass too. Um, so, oh, Lucy, day after tomorrow. Okay. You're worried about the written test. Lucy, I've got a practice test on my website um, for your CNA.com. Look under training and there's practice tests on there. That may help you. And um, Lucy says, my friends practice skills from your channel last week and she passed. Great. Congratulations. That's awesome. All right, guys, I got to wrap this up. Unfortunately, I got uh, got to go jump on another call, but uh, I will see you next week, Thursday at three, same time, same place. And I promise, Jennifer, I will talk about diabetes. I think you're probably one of my number one fans as well, because you're always here. And I love that. Um, you guys are the best. So uh, we will talk about diabetes next week. And if you have any other questions, make sure you bring them to next week's session. And um, I hope you guys have a fantastic week. Until next time, guys, happy caregiving.